Shalom, my friends. Welcome to Weekly Parsha with Yehuda Yisrael. This week's Parsha is Parshat Beha Alotecha. And we will start with Numbers chapter 8 is where we're picking up. So, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you light the lamps, the seven lamps shall cast their light toward the face of the menorah. So it's speaking about the menorah, the seven-branched candelabra, or the, I guess there's three in, three branches on each side and one in the middle. Aaron did so, and he lit the lamps toward the face of the menorah, as the Lord commanded Moses. And this was the form of the menorah, hammered work of gold, and its base and its flower. It was hammered work according to the form that the Lord had shown Moses so did he construct the menorah. So this is the idea of also an oral tradition, the form that uh, the Lord had shown Moses. This wasn't something that was written down in words. There was had to be some sort of whatever form or, or something um, described in some way that was beyond just the written words that you see in the Torah that would be conveyed to future generations so another demonstration of the oral torah the lord spoke to moses saying take the levites from among the children of israel and cleanse them this is what you shall do to them so as to cleanse them sprinkle them with cleansing water and pass a razor over all their flesh and they shall wash their garments and cleanse themselves and then it's discussing a bull offering that they will make as a sin offering and bring the Levites to the tent of meeting and gather all the congregation of Israel. And the Levites shall come before the Lord and the children of Israel shall lay their hands upon the Levites. And Aaron shall lift up the Levites as a waving before the Lord on behalf of the children of Israel that they may serve in the Lord's service. So they're all together in this waving ceremony. <laughs> and the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of the bulls. And one and make one as a sin offering and one as a burnt offering to the Lord to atone for the Levites. And you shall present the Levites before Aaron and his sons and lift them as a waving before the Lord. Thus you shall set apart the Levites from the midst of the children of Israel and the Levites shall become mine. Okay, so differentiating between them and showing this ceremony, the weave. <laughs> so following this, the Levites shall come to the to serve in the tent of meeting, the Ohel Moed, you shall cleanse them and lift them as a waving, for they are wholly given over to me from among the children of Israel, instead of those that open the womb, all the firstborn of Israel I have taken for myself, right? We discussed the firstborn initially had a priestly status, and then after the sin of the golden calf, there was a change, and we have the Levites acting as the priests for all the firstborn among the children of israel are mine whether man or beast since the day i smote all the firstborn in the land of egypt i have sanctified them for myself the firstborn are mine as so rashi says the firstborn are mine by right i protected them among the egyptian firstborn i took them for myself until they erred through the golden calf exactly what i said before so now i have taken levites verse 18 right and it's explicitly said in the next verse, and I've taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel. I've given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to perform the service for the children of Israel in the tent of meeting and to atone on behalf of the children of Israel so that the children of Israel will not be inflicted with plague when they approach the sanctuary. Uh, so, yeah, that is their role. And so Moses and Aaron and the entire congregation did this and to the Levites and the children of Israel did in accordance with all that the Lord had instructed Moses regarding the Levites. And the Levites cleansed themselves and washed their clothes and Aaron lifted them as a waving before the Lord and Aaron atoned for them and uh, to cleanse them, right? As his role as the high priest. And after that, the Levites came to perform the service in the tent of meeting before Aaron and his sons. And they did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses regarding the Levites. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the rule concerning the Levites from the age of 25 and upwards. He shall enter into the service to work in the tent of meeting. So 
that is when the Levites uh, take up their roles. From the age of 50, he shall retire from the work lesion and do no more work. Okay, so <laughs> retirement age, 50. And he shall minister with his brethren in the tent of meeting to keep charge, but he shall not perform the service. Thus you shall do for the Levites regarding their charge. So I guess at a certain point they are kind of like priest emeritus. <laughs> you know, they're overseeing that and, and probably instructing the younger Levites how to minister and do the priestly rites in the uh, tent of meeting. The Lord spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert in the second year of their exodus from the land of Egypt in the first month, saying, The children of Israel shall make a Passover sacrifice in its appointed time. On the afternoon of the fourteenth of this month, you shall make it in its appointed time, according to in accordance with all its statutes and ordinances, you shall make it. Moses spoke to children of Israel, instructing them to make Passover sacrifice. So they made a Passover sacrifice in the first month, on the afternoon, the fourteenth day of the month, uh, in the Sinai desert, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And so did the children of Israel do. And there were men who were ritually unclean because of contact with a dead person and therefore could not make the sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice on that day. So they approached Moses and Aaron on that day. So this is, you know, they wanted to participate in this, but they couldn't. And um, it says, those men said to him, we are ritually unclean because we came in contact with a dead person. But why should we be excluded so as not to bring an offering to the Lord in its appointed time with all the children of Israel? They're like, why should we be excluded? We want to participate in this mitzvah. We want to be able to keep Pesach. And Moses said to them, wait, and I will hear what the Lord instructs concerning you. Right? So Moses needed to uh, get instruction from God. Now, it's interesting because our friend, we have some friends in the Christian world who say, oh, how could there be an oral Torah if Moses needed to ask God directly more instructions after he received the oral Torah at Har Sinai? What people forget is that Moses is actually doing exactly what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 17 regarding what Levites and the judge of that time are supposed to do. If there's a question that they have, they go to the place that Lord will choose and then God instructs them, and then they go according to what those leaders say. So Moses is receiving that word from God. So just because Moses is asking God for instruction past the time that he received the oral Torah, right, it doesn't mean that that contradicts the idea that the oral Torah was given at Sinai because in the written Torah, it says that this is what they're supposed to do when they have a question. So that doesn't negate the idea just because Moses is going and asking God questions subsequently after Har Sinai, it does not mean that that contradicts the idea that the oral Torah was given at Har Sinai because within the jurisdiction of the oral law, according actually to the written Torah in Deuteronomy 17, this is the process that you do. You go to the place that God chooses. You ask God, you know, of course you're going to ask. Moses, according to the Torah, was had a special connection with God that no other prophet had. So, of course you're going to do this. It doesn't negate the idea that the oral Torah was given at Har Sinai. So, for any of you silly Christians out there who want to argue against the oral Torah... Close but no cigar. The written Torah actually accounts for this. So keep trying to poke holes in the idea that the oral Torah doesn't exist because clearly it does. It always has, and it's sourced at Moses. And this is a perfect example of that. So speak to the children of Israel saying, any person that becomes unclean from contact with the dead or is on a distant journey, whether among you or in future generations, he shall make a Passover sacrifice for the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day in the afternoon, they shall make it, and they shall eat it with unleavened cakes and bitter herbs. So this is what is known as Pesach Sheni, and it happens um, the month after the initial uh, holiday of 
of Passover. So it's just delayed a month. And you see this actually happening, um, arguably, in the, well, okay, it gets complicated, but there's in, in Chronicles, there's a situation where this happened. They shall not leave over anything from it until the next morning, and they shall not break any of its bones. They shall make in accordance with all the statutes connected with the Passover sacrifice. But the man who is ritually, un ritually clean and not on a journey, yet refrain from making the Passover sacrifice, his soul shall be cut off from his people. For he did not bring the offering of the Lord in its appointed time, and that person shall bear sin. So you want to make sure that you do do that. If a proselyte dwells with you and he makes a Passover sacrifice to the Lord according to the statutes of the Passover sacrifice and its ordinances, he shall make it. One statute shall apply to you, to the proselyte, and to the native-born citizen. Okay. So now, on the day the Mishkan was erected, the cloud hovered over the Mishkan, which was a tent for the testimony, and on that evening there was over the Mishkan like an appearance of fire, which remained until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it, and there was an appearance of fire at night. And according to the cloud's departure over the tent and afterwards the children of israel would travel in the place where the cloud settled and the children of israel would encamp the bidding of the lord the children of israel traveled and the bidding of the lord they encamped as long as the cloud hovered above the mishkan they encamped so this is the on the covered when the cloud lingered over the mishkan for many days the children of israel kept charge of the Lord and did not travel. Sometimes the cloud remained for several days above the Mishkan. At the Lord's bidding they camped, and at the Lord's bidding they traveled. Sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, and when the cloud departed in the morning they traveled, or when the cloud remained for a day and a night, when the cloud departed they traveled. Whether it was for two days, a month, or a year, that the cloud lingered to hover over the Mishkan, the children of Israel would encamp and not travel. When it departed, they traveled. At the Lord's bidding, they would encamp, and the Lord's bidding, they would travel, and they kept charge of the Lord by the word of the Lord through Moses. Okay, but mid March chapter 10, moving on. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make yourselves two silver trumpets. You shall make them from a beaten form, and they shall be used by you to summon the congregation to announce the departure of the camps. When they blow on them, the entire congregation shall assemble to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If they blow one of them, the princes and leaders of Israel, thousands shall convene to you. And when you blow a true series of short blasts, the camps or in camp shall travel to the east shall travel. And when you blow a second true, the camps and camp to the south shall travel, and they shall blow a true for traveling, but when the congregation, or, but when assembling the congregation, you shall blow a tekia. <laughs> this is where you get all the shofar blasts that we use, you know, and on uh, typically on Rosh Hashanah, we 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 do this. Um, you shall blow a tekia long blast, but not a terua. The descendants of Aaron and the priests shall blow the trumpets. This shall be an eternal statute for you and your generations, right? So this is an idea that this, obviously we know the Levitical priesthood is not going anywhere. We made several videos on that, so check that out. Um, you know, it's very much connected to the future days of the Messiah when the Levitical priesthood will be restored back to its former glory. Check Malachi chapter 3 if you're interested. If you go into war against the land of an adversary that oppresses you, you shall blow a trua with the trumpets and be remembered before the Lord your God and thus be saved from your enemies. On the days of rejoicing on your festivals and on your new moon celebrations, you shall blow on the trumpets for your ascent offerings and your peace sacrifices, and it shall be a remembrance before your God. I am the Lord your God. Great. Okay. So yeah, it's discussing how, uh, I guess, holidays are inaugurated. A lot of people argue against the idea of Rosh Hashanah in the Tanakh. I'm going to make a video on that, I think, when we get closer. Spoiler alert for that, though. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 40, you have a reference to it. It's not something that rabbis made up. It's actually in the Tanakh, and 
there is strong evidence to support that that was exactly what was what that when Ezekiel received that prophecy of the third temple, it was on Yom Kippur, which was in Rosh Hashanah, the first month of the year, um, which is in that sense, it was the first month based on the Yovel, right? During the Jubilee year, the that's when you announce it is in the month of Tishrei. So it was described as Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. And on that 10th day, that's when Yom Kippur was taking place, and that's when Ezekiel received that prophecy of the third temple. So I'll make a video about that in the future in case you're interested. On the 20th of the second month of the second year, the cloud rose up over the tabernacle of the testimony. The children of Israel traveled on their journeys from the Sinai Desert. The cloud settled in the desert of Paran. Oh boy, I think this is where it has all the places that they traveled. And this is the journey at God's bidding through Moses. So the banner of the camp of Judah. His children traveled first according to their lesions. Heading the lesion was Nachshon, right? The famous Nachshon who went into the Yamsu first. The son of Amyadab, right? So we we were introduced to all these people <laughs> and the Gershonites and, and all of these. It's just talking about the heads of the tribes. And previous Parshiot, we, we talked about who these people were. Um... We don't necessarily have to read them all again, but yeah, if you're curious, you can go back. Oh, here's an interesting part where it says, Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel the Midianite. So this is according to this, this is Yitro, as it says, the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. So, and Rashi gives a proof for this. What does scripture mean by saying the daughters of Jethro came their father Ruel? Teaches that, children called their grandfather father he had many names jethro because through him a portion was added added yeter to the torah hobab because hobab he loved the torah okay so once again oral torah gives us you know if you take this verse at face value you wouldn't be able to uh make this connection but that's why you need oral torah to understand this so we are traveling to the place about which the Lord said, I will give to you. Come with us and we will be good to you. The Lord has spoken for good fortune for Israel. And he said to him, I won't go, for I will go to my land and in my birth, in my birthplace. He said, please don't leave us. For because you are familiar with our encampments in the desert, and you will be our, gar our guide. And if you go with us, then we will bestow. Stow upon you the good which God grants us. And they traveled the distance from three days of the, from the mountain of the Lord in the ark of the of the Lord's covenant traveled three days ahead of them to seek for them a place to settle. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day and when they traveled from the camp. Just wanted to look at this. When it says about bestowing good, what good did they actually bestow upon him? They said, when Israel apportioned the land, it was a fertile area of Jericho measuring 500 by 500 cubits, and they refrained from allocating it. They said, the one in whose portion the temple will be built shall take it. Meanwhile, they gave it to the descendants of Jethro, to Jonadab, the son of Rechab, as it says. The sons of okay, interesting. All right, on to the sixth Aliyah. So it was whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Kuma Hashem v'yefutsu o'yevecha v'yanusu misanecha mipanecha. If you've ever gone to a Saturday morning service, you're very familiar with this on Shabbat. Um, Arise, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered. And may those who hate you flee from you. So that's what we say when we discuss. Uh, yeah, this is when we open the ark. By heaving so Aharon, by your man Moshe. Right? So, <laughs> very familiar to Jews. And then you have, when it came to rest, he would say, Repose, O Lord, among the myriads of thousands of Israel. The people were looking to complain, and it was evil in the ears of the Lord. The Lord heard, and his anger flared, and a fire from the Lord burned among 
them, consuming the extremes of the camp. Ooh, that's scary. The people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So you see, praying is able to have a direct effect, especially when it came from Moses, the leader of the people. You, you, you're able to, through your repentance and your sincerity, as we discussed in Leviticus chapter 26, you can atone for your sins through prayer. And you don't have to believe in Jesus' blood or Jesus dying for your sins. This has always been a principle that you can repent and there's no requirement that you need Jesus' blood to accomplish salvation or atonement or forgiveness. So another perfect example here. He named that place Taberah, for the fire of the Lord had been burned among them there. But the multitude among them began to have strong cravings. And then even the children of Israel once again began to cry. And they said, who will feed us meat? Oh, this is the infamous uh, <laughs> part where they start complaining about meat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge, and the cucumbers, and the watermelons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our bodies are dried out, for there is nothing at all, for we have nothing but mana to look at. So they're nostalgic for the times of Egypt, ironically, right? Now the mono was like coriander seed, and its appearance was like the appearance of crystal. Right, so this is, if you're wondering what mono looks like, this is the way it is explicitly described. And the people walked about it and gathered it, and they ground it in a mill or crushed it in the mortar. They cooked it in the pot and made it into cakes. It had a taste like the taste of oil cake. Interesting. So, when the dew descended upon the camp at night, the mana would descend upon it. And Moses heard the people weeping with their families, each one at the entrance to his tent, and the Lord became very angry, and Moses considered it evil. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your eyes that you place the burden of this entire people upon me? Interesting. <laughs> Moses is concerned about this. Did I conceive this entire people? Did I give birth to them? That you say to me, carry them on your bosom as the nurse carries the suckling to the land you promised their forefathers? So Moses is kind of questioning why God gave him this responsibility. Where can I get meat to give all these people? For they are crying on me, saying, Give us meat to eat. I alone cannot carry this entire people, for it is too hard for me. If this is the way you treat me, please kill me if I have found favor in your eyes, so that I not see my misfortune. Oh, goodness. This was a difficult moment for, for Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Assemble me seventy men of elders of Israel, who you know to be the people's elders and officers. And you shall take them to the tent of meeting, and they shall stand there before you. So this is basically a Sanhedrin of sorts, yeah? Looks like that's what this is establishing. So, now we will move on to, it will, I will come down and speak with you there, and I will increase the spirit that is upon you, and bestow it upon them. And they will bear the burden of the people with you so that you need not bear it alone. So there's a dispersion of responsibility, not just on Moshe. And once again, this is where you get this idea in Deuteronomy 17. And this is how the oral Torah, you know, takes shape is that it's not just on one person, is that there is a certain level of dispersion of authority. It's not just one judge. It's not just one priest. It's... It's among many that are able to make these decisions. And the people shall say, prepare yourselves tomorrow and you shall eat meat because you have cried in the ears of the Lord saying, who will feed us meat? For we had it better in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall not eat it. You shall eat it not one day, not two days, not five days, not 10 days, not 20 days. But even for a full month until it comes out your nose and nauseates you because you have despised the Lord who is among you and you cried before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt, right? So it's like you get what you, be careful what you wish for, you know, the cliche, but this is, you know, taking it to that extreme just to make a point. 
Moses said 6,000 people on the foot, or sorry, 600,000 people on the on foot are people in whose midst I am. And you say, I will not give them meat and they will eat it for a full month. So this is where we get the idea that 600,000 people, it's referring to obviously the, it's understood that it's referring to the men who are of age. And that's where we get the idea that according to the Torah, you had at least 600,000 people, men of age, who heard God speak at Har Sinai, which is a mass revelation that really no other religion claims, which gives credence to the Torah. So, yeah, uh, maybe I'll make a video on that to show why Judaism has a unique claim of truth. If sheep and cattle were slaughtered for them, would it not suffice for them? If all the fish of the sea were gathered for them, would it not suffice for them? Then the Lord said to Moses, is my power lifted? Now you will see if my word comes true for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord said, and he assembled 70 men of the elders of the people and stood them around the tent. And the Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to them, and spoke to him. And he increased some of the spirit that was on him and bestowed it, this, and bestowed it to the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not continue. So you have a dispersion of, of this divine authority. And now two men remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the second was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them, and they were among those written. But they did not go out to the tent, but they prophesied in the camp. Right. Among them, chosen for the St. Hedrim, all of them were written down, mentioned specifically by name, but the number was chosen by lot because the number of elders of the 12 tribes came six from each tribe except two tribes, which would have only five. Interesting. So this is, <laughs> yeah, if you find that interesting how the people were chosen for the St. Hedron. <laughs> the lad ran and told Moses, saying, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the servant from his youth answered, said, Moses, my master, imprison them. Because they are, I guess, using authority that Yehoshua didn't realize that they were able to, to do that. Impose upon them communal responsibilities and they will be finished as prophets by themselves. Another interpretation is that they were prophesizing that Moses would die and that Joshua would take them into the land of Israel. Joshua didn't want to hear that. And Moses said to them, are you zealous for my sake? If only all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would bestow his spirit upon them. So he kind of flips it around on Joshua and says, wouldn't you want everybody to have this close connection to Hashem? Um, <laughs> you know, wishful thinking maybe, but yeah. Then Moses entered the camp and he and, he and the elders of Israel. A wind went forth from the Lord and swept, his, and swept quails from the sea and spread them over the camp about one day's journey in this way in one day's journey that way around the camp about two cubits above the ground and the people rose up all that day and all night and the next day and gathered the quails the one who even get, gathered the, the least collected ten heaps and they spread them around the camp in the piles and the meat was still between their teeth it was not yet finished and the anger of the Lord flared against his people and the Lord struck the people with a very mighty blow he named that place Kivot. I'm not going to try the transliteration. Kiv wrote Hata'ava, <laughs> Graves of Craving, where they buried the people who craved, right? So they got, I guess, what they wanted. They got their meat. And the people traveled to Hatzerot and they stayed in Hatzerot. Oh, here is a very infamous part of. Wow, okay, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the Book of Numbers. Um, I did a whole video about this. It shows Moses' uniqueness. Moses and Aaron spoke against Moses regarding the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman, so it's debatable if that's referring to Tzipporah. Um, 
they said, has Moses spoken only to Moses? Hasn't he spoken to us too? And the Lord heard. And this man Moses was exceedingly humble, more so than any person on the face of the earth. That's a unique trait of Moses. The Lord suddenly said to Moses and Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, go out, all three of you, to the tent of meeting. And all three went out, and the Lord descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. He called to Aaron and Miriam, and they both went out. And he said, Please listen to my words. If there be prophets among you, the Lord will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. So this is for prophets in general. But Moses is unique. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful throughout my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth. So this is an expression, right? In a vision and not in riddles, he beholds what is known in Hebrew as Temunat Hashem, which loosely translates to the image of the Lord, of the Lord. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So you can see, like, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, Christians will quote, you know, say like, oh, look, you are seeing God, there's the image of a man. It's a vision. If you actually see the beginning of the uh, chapter in Ezekiel chapter one, it's it, he's not actually seeing a physical representation of God. It's it's in a dream state, right? And that's what's unique about Moses is whatever he's seeing is unique to Moses, and that's why when you look at Deuteronomy chapter four, it says when God spoke, they saw no image. It says they saw no Tamuna. Moses is unique in that whatever he sees is some sort of image of sorts. But whatever that means is impossible for us to understand. So that's why we understand that God is not going to appear to us in any form. So that's why, according to Deuteronomy 4, we can recognize if we actually care what God's saying, we're not going to assume that God is going to take the form of a man in the form of Jesus or anyone else. We would say the opposite because God is explicitly saying he's not going to do that. Only Moses would have any perception of whatever that means. Um, even when you go to Exodus 24, which Christians like to abuse the context of and say, well, what were they, you know, what were they seeing? Well, clearly they weren't seeing an image of God. They weren't seeing a Tamuna because only Moses, according to this verse, experiences whatever Tamuna to Shep means that is unique to Moses. And then when you see the children of Israel being discussed, it says that they do not see Tamuna to Shem. So whatever they saw wasn't an image. It wasn't a man. And there's really no way around it. So I'll make a video on that again if you still have questions about that. <laughs> but um, this is demonstrating that God would not do that. He would not appear in the form of a man. So the wrath of the Lord flared against them, and he left, and a cloud departed from above the tent. And behold, Miriam was afflicted with Sarah as white as snow, and Aaron turned to Miriam, and behold, she was afflicted with Mitzorat, right? And Aaron said to Moses, Please, Master, do not put sin upon us for acting foolishly and for sinning. So this is the idea of Lashon Hara, which is, uh, you know, speaking badly about other people. Let her not be like the dead, which comes out of his mother's womb with half his flesh consumed. And Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, I beseech you, God, please heal her. And the Lord replied to Moses, if her father were to spit in her face, would she not be humiliated for seven days? She shall be confined for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may enter. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not travel until Miriam had entered, and the people departed departed from Mehatserot, and they camped in the desert of Paran. So, interesting. So, yeah, I hope this video has been a blessing to you all. Shalom Aleichem.